So part two, and this is the new stuff, we're going to put cholesterol and particles into some kind of context. So first I'll show the MISA studied calcification of Western people, mostly American. And this is men. And as you can see, around 50% of the population, they have very little calcification as they go from their 40s up to their 70s. So that's the half of the population who have very few cardiac events. They're their healthy guys. And then back you got the 10 or 5% of worst calcification get enormous calcification growing, as you can see in those ramps. And that's where most of the heart attacks occur. Not exclusively, but this isn't rocket science, right? The guys who are racking up the calcium are destroying their arteries. They're the ones where most events will occur. Now, we could look at another people, very different, the main men, very different peoples, other side of the world. But first we'd look, at, before we see their calcification, we'll look at what they achieve. They achieve very low insulin, very low blood glucose, no diabetic physiology versus most of the people in the West, no hypertension, blood pressure, no central obesity, understandably, great omega-3 to omega-6 ratio in their foods. So you can kind of corral these together and say, for sure they have no metabolic syndrome, no hyperinsulinemia syndrome, right? Which is a big deal. They have none of that, not a trace. So what do they get in calcification? Well, they get this. Age matched, like with like, humans, same as these are humans. That's what they achieve. Now, we're not going to get into their diet and stuff because they have a very special environment with many factors at play, but they achieve it. It has been said, oh, well, these are special genetic people and could have special genetics, you know, so are, are they unicorns? Are they the only people on the planet who can miraculously do this? And the answer is no. The Catavans with a high coconut saturated fat diet and high unprocessed carbs, in fairness, living with sun exposure and all the vitamins and minerals, they achieve this and ultra-low heart disease also. And they're a different genetic people. So the human machine can, in certain circumstances, be made extremely healthy. And most of it is what goes in the mouth. This list of great things that are really important, I'm going to put a target sign on now. So I want you to think in the next 20 minutes, when you see the target sign, you'd, you'd be thinking, well, what will this list of great things that I achieve, how will that affect the cholesterol problem? And I'll show you. So many years ago, I did the cholesterol conundrum. It's on YouTube for anyone who wants to get into the detail of the cholesterol transport system and how it relates to pathology, energy delivery, and all of it. But I did raise, besides how the system worked, I raised the problems with the LDL particle count being seen as a God number. And you can see here from this study, for instance, high and middle uh, total cholesterol over HDL ratio people, generally that means they're insulin resistant. It's a good proxy for insulin resistance. Well, for those people, going from low to high ApoB racked up their relative risk. And that makes sense. ApoB is a, quite a potent risk factor. However, you may have noticed that for the low ratio people who would be insulin sensitive and healthy, Higher ApoB actually resulted in lower risk. So you can see this dichotomy, you might call it. You've got to be very careful with ApoB particle numbers. Am I in that group or am I in this group? And not just using the ratio, but in general, using all the numbers. What group am I in? Because if you don't know what group you're in, you won't know what to do with it. So I went through a lot of papers in the last couple of months. This is my desk at home, putting it together. And uh, I had to go to my podcast desk because I had so many papers printed out, I lost control. A lot of paper, around 200 papers for the coming material. Uh, and they all did, in the end, dovetail together. So here is the atherosclerotic process. So we're not going to go through the inflammatory cascade because it's very well established, the science, and we're pretty happy with that, and it's very complex. But I will say that the target list of things you need to get right will help hugely with this inflammatory cascade. What we want to focus on is the LDL hypothesis bit, that more particles will get into your artery wall and kick off this mess. That's the LDL, that's the kernel of the LDL hypothesis. But it's not so simple as they'll just get in, gradient, diffusion. They'll just go in there. If you have more of them, they'll more will go in. Uh, there are three layers of evolutionary design systems to not have LDLs go in willy-nilly. One, two, three. 
The first is the glycocalyx, an extraordinary structure discovered 30 years ago. And the reason they hadn't discovered it in so long, it's these blue hair-like uh, structures, you know, made of proteins, amino acids, and, uh, and glucose. The reason they didn't find it was it's destroyed the moment you take it out of the body. It disappears. So they never actually knew it was there, but they did discover it then. And it has a sieving effect, and it manages particles and platelets, and it manages what systems and what inflammatory molecules can access the endothelium, the, the single cell layer at the inner wall of your artery down here. So it has a very important function that no one knew about. Then you've got the endothelial cells themselves. It's a single layer of cells locked together with tight junctions, and that really is the barrier to your artery wall. But then you've got the proteoglycans, which again are sugar-based structures that can trap LDL and other particles, hold them, oxidize them, get them engulfed, taken away to be dealt with, right? And if you overload them, you're, you're probably going to have a problem, right? You're, you're not going to be able to take them all away and manage them. You're going to get a buildup of inflammation. So there are the three layers. One, two, three. But what we really want to know is what governs or determines or mediates or decides how this three-layer leakage goes ahead. You could have very little leakage across the three layers, or you could have a hell of a lot. What, what decides that? Because that's a massive question. If you have higher LDL numbers, you've got to know what state this is in. That's fair. So the glycocalyx, let's take a look. Here it is in a, a high-resolution electron microscope picture, and uh, it's basically like little hairs, as you can see there. And it keeps the inside surface slick, it protects the endothelial cells. Uh, the strands, believe it or not, move in the blood flow, and they act as mechanosensors, and they actually trigger nitric oxide release from endothelial cells based on how they sway in the blood flow and a million things more. But I just thought I'd give you a feeling. This, this stuff, evolution, wasn't messing around when it designed this layer. Put it that way. Here's a paper with a great title I got during my couple of weeks. Arterial glycocalyx dysfunction is the first step in the atherothrombotic process. Wow, that's a strong statement. And it was a great paper. And they, they made a lot of cases for this. So not the first step that LDL wanders across, you know, and opens a door it shouldn't and finds itself in the wrong room. No, no, no. This is the first step, they would say. So here is a group who are developing things to help the glycocalyx. I have no connections to them. The effect of a high-carb meal. Here's your normal glycocalyx. Two hours later, four and six hours later. And these are actual, you know, scans taken. That's what happens. And particularly hyperglycemia and high sugar has been shown to damage it. You know, if your blood sugar levels are nominal, the glycocalyx is happy. But if you bring up the glucose a little high, suddenly it doesn't like it. So that's the kind of relationship. Body takes 8 to 12 hours to recover this situation. And these guys have scanned real humans. Uh, 8 to 12 hours. But most people are going to dump another, you know, pound of carby junk in on top of themselves after three or four hours, right? Everyone's eating all the time, and they're eating sad diets. So how is it ever going to recover? Here it is shown in beautiful health. You can see the glycocalyx strands there, and there's an outer barrier area they've more recently discovered. And it keeps the red blood cells and platelets and other elements, as I said, away from the wall of your artery. Here's one in a rotten state, so you've been chugging Coca-Cola or smoking cigarettes or whatever you've been doing, right? And as we can see here, the LDLs have much more access to the endothelium, the LDL particles. This group did a great experiment. They said, well, what if we damage it in the lab, carefully damage it? What will happen, the rate of LDL internalization into the endothelial cells? How much bigger will it get if we damage this puppy? So. They damaged it with neuramidase, and they got 10 times more LDL getting into the endothelial cell. And that was impressive. But then they went for gold, and they said, hey, what if we hit it with like cationized copper uh, or, or ferritin? What if we really kill it? So they did. They used ferritin, and they got it down and measured to 5% of its previous thickness. And they said, right, this is really stripped. And they got 20 times 
the LDL getting down into the endothelial area and going into the cells. So that illustrates the importance of your glycocalyx. Uh, you've got to respect your glycocalyx, guys. <laughs> Big time. So the other papers I have broadly, high sugar, standard American diets will do this. Hypertension and hypertension-related uh, signaling molecules do this. Oxidative stress, sure, oxidized LDL, but not native LDL, interestingly. Smoking blows away your glycocalyx. That's one of the big problems with smoking. Arterial morphology. Atheroma and atherosclerotic plaques occur in very focal areas at branch points of arteries, and they've always been wondering why. One of the reasons is it looks like at those points, they've been looking at the thickness of the glycocalyx, and it can be 60% or more thinner right at the branch points for reasons I won't get into. But there are papers now saying, hey, that's probably one of the reasons for the focal problem. And very briefly, ischemia reperfusion. When you do operations on people, you bring in oxygenation, and you can get rapid atherosclerosis in the segments that you've replaced, very rapid. And now there's papers tying that to the destroyed glycocalyx in the days and weeks following the operation is probably the major uh, reason for, for what? For the accelerated atherosclerosis at those points, right? It's this important. Again, there's our target list. If you're doing all these things right, you know, you're going to have way less of this problem. Layer two, the endothelium. Gets a bit heavy here. So here's an endothelial cell, you know, happy camper, and here's the junction, tight junction with the next one, and they form a barrier. Here's your lumen, or the core of your artery, the red blood cells going by, and here's all your little happy LDLs, you know, bubbling around in your blood. I'll first go through endocytosis, uh, because there were podcasts recently talking about this, and I wanted to clarify. Brown and Goldstein won Nobel Prizes. But they discovered the LDL receptor. And endocytosis is when the cell, for its own needs, brings in an LDL cholesterol particle and breaks it up and takes its goodies out. That's for its own needs. We're not going across here into your artery wall, right? And in fact, a study quite some time back showed that when you increase the LDL concentration up here by 10 times, the endocytosis of LDL into the endothelial cells didn't even change because the cell knows what it wants. It doesn't care what's outside unless it's all gone, <laughs> in which case you've got a problem. So this is transcytosis, and I want people to focus now. Transcytosis is the process that actively manages taking LDL across the endothelial cell into the artery wall. Now, evolution is not an idiot, so it did this for a reason. You can argue about the reason. They have question marks because even in 2018, the top experts in this are acknowledging, we're really not sure how this works. It's kind of embarrassing. So people have not been too interested in this for some reason. I leave people to guess why. So that's what happens. Here it is done with gold particles attached to LDL. Up here is the endothelial cell. And after a few minutes with LDL, with gold particles attached so they could track it, you see the little black dots of gold, right? The gold is brought in by the LDL into vacuoles, into the cell, within minutes. Within 20, 30 minutes, they're seeing LDL particles and their carried gold coming out, essentially, in the intima, on the other side of the cell. So they're kind of like little Irish leprechauns, bringing their wee pots of gold across the endothelium. <laughs> so, and you could make other jokes about LDL and gold, you know, as in, how valuable LDL could be, but we won't get into that. So here they are. So that's demonstrated. In fact, 25% nearly off the LDL, and I think it was only a couple of hour period, had actually done the full journey. A substantial, nearly a quarter of it was out the other side, free, into your artery wall. So there. For transcytosis, which we're talking about, they did a 10 times higher LDL concentration up here, like I mentioned with the endo. And in fairness, it doubled the transcytosis. So 10 times LDL concentration, double the transcytosis. Not, it's not a huge factor, you know, it's not 10 times. And for instance, 
In this experiment with TNF-alpha, an inflammatory component associated with insulin resistance, obesity, diabetes, uh, it's a very active component in the body uh, when it gets going. Using TNF-alpha introduced at physiologic levels brought up the transcytosis by four and a half times by bringing in TNF-alpha. So you can see there's a lot of other things ruling transcytosis. And your brain, I heard it said recently that your brain doesn't take in LDL, it makes its own. Now it does make its own cholesterol mostly, but here's this paper. And essentially what they did was they demonstrated LDL receptors in the blood-brain barrier taking in LDLs, transcytosing across the blood-brain barrier and into the brain for use. So evolution decided to do this. Uh, they also took the astrocytes from inside the brain, the brain cells, and they depleted them in cholesterol. They said, let's take the cholesterol out of them. And we do the experiment again and see, does the brain ask for more? That'd be cool. So, so they did it. And the brain did ask for more. The depleted astrocytes with lowered cholesterol upregulated the LDL receptors in the blood-brain barrier and took through quite a lot more cholesterol. So this is really fascinating science. So, and it's your brain, which is important. So what kinds of things drive transcytosis? This is back to our million dollar question. What things will make this go too fast, too much LDL? And there you have it, C-reactive protein, oxidized LDL, radical oxygen species, lipopolysaccharide from leaky gut demonstrated to do this. All these bad things that are essentially highly linked to our target list of important factors, again. Last one, paracellular transport. Doesn't even end here. Paracellular transport is the leakage of LDL particles through the tight junctions between the endothelial cells and getting into your arterial wall. And you can have macro pores too. There's tons of science on this out there. It's just hard to find. These tight junctions are exotic, three layers of ultra exotic junctions to keep them tight. But they do break down and they do get damaged. So one thing again, TNF-alpha, inflammatory component. They introduced that and they got four and a half times more permeability through this path, right? We saw it with transcytosis also here. And the clever guys worked out the mechanism. They saw that the TNF-alpha was causing apoptosis or cell death of the endothelial cells. And as they died and turned over, they were opening up these junctions as they fluxed. And the apoptosis or cell death directly correlated with the amount of LDL going through, straight line. So they're really tying this together, you know, it's an exciting time for this science. What causes then this generally? We saw TNF-alpha, angiotensin II relating to blood pressure, and any insult to the endothelial cells is going to cause turnover and allow more LDL flux to occur. Right? So you don't want to do that. How do you make sure you don't do that? Well, make sure you cover this list at the very least, right? No brainer. Last one, the intima proteoglycans, because there's still a layer, layer three. So down here, we have in the wall of your artery, here's your blood up here, LDLs that do get in can get trapped on these proteoglycan structures. And they get stuck there, they get oxidized, they get eaten by macrophage, and they get dealt with, right? So that's the way the body deals with them. But we'd be interested in what causes increased LDL reactivity and binding with these proteoglycans. What kind of factors make them bind a lot or bind not so much? That'd be important if you're worried about cholesterol. So here's the papers I have. Blood from heart attack patients, blood from insulin resistant people, blood from type two diabetics. They all greatly increase, even with cholesterol standardized, greatly increase the binding down here. Small, dense, and oxidized LDL, especially with APOC3 on board, which is a sign of insulin resistance, right? And small denses too, much higher affinity. Type 1 diabetic mice, I don't like mice experiments, but in this one, the diabetic mice with the same cholesterol levels as the wild type healthy mice, eight times more cholesterol particles were getting bound in here from the diabetic mice. So these guys in these study groups are on the right track, right? They're looking to see what mediates the LDL particle being a problem. And unsurprisingly, you've got a huge overlap with our classic target list of things not to do. 
So there you go, one, two, three, three layers of evolutionary de designed wonder, which will keep your LDL particles being happy if you do the right thing. And a set of very important factors that's common to nearly every part of this system becoming dysfunctional. And more, if you have ob obscure inflammatory conditions, it it'll drive it too. It's not all these, but these are the big Pareto, the elephant. A bonus layer, just when you thought you were going to get away. Small bonus layer, and I'm good on time. This is more recently I've been looking into oxidized LDL, and it's quite controversial. And I will have to warn you that this is kind of heretical. So you guys are going to be party to a heresy here. Now, I, I don't think they, they burn you alive anymore for that, but you might get, I don't know, an increased tax rate or something else. We'll see. So you're, you're all here of your own free will. So here is a paper that's fascinating, and it's actually 1999, I think. Oh, no, sorry, 2009. And there's a problem here. And the problem is that this guy or team who wrote this paper were quite clear on what causes atherosclerosis. They say that LDLs damaged in your blood through hyperglycemia or all the other stuff become problematic they damage the endothelial, they damage the glycocalyx, they then come in, and in here they're a problem, and the system tries to mop them up. But the problem with this paper is the heresy, because they are saying that native standard LDL, regardless of quantity, is not part of this. Now, the whole LDL hypothesis at its core, there's a crucial understanding. It is ordinary native LDL that gets in, gets oxidized, and causes the problem. So these guys are heretics, no question. But let's look to see that they have any studies that justify them. And this is a different team. And they took healthy controls and hypercholesterolemic patients. Now, they didn't have much data, but they had massive LDL, ratios were bad, and they were patients. So they picked people they figure probably had an issue. They took all their LDL, well, not all of it. <laughs> they took a big sample of LDL, and they broke it up into different layers, L1 to L5. L1, L2, and L3 are not oxidized. They're not desilated. They're, they're native healthy. And both groups had plenty of that. Uniquely, these guys had L4 and L5, which is very mildly oxidized and moderately oxi oxidized. They're not, they're not completely destroyed. So they said, wow, now we've got a distinction between the healthy and the non-healthy. Let's, let's see what it does. So they looked in an experiment at percentage cell death by introducing these particles, endothelial cell death. And they saw for L1 to L3, basically nothing. So OK. And when they put all three together and dumped it in, nothing. Nothing really happened. But then the L4 and L5. Now you rock it up to 40% of the cells in the solution were killed, essentially. And they went further, and they oxidized the bejesus out of LDL. <laughs> they gave it a ruddy good kicking with copper. So they really oxidized it way more than L5. This is minimally oxidized. This is massive. But notice they didn't get much more result. So they said this minimally oxidized LDL we can measure in the blood appears to be a massive actor right, in destroying endothelium, which will lead to all the other problems. And we know that this oxidized LDL measure, it's available, has massive odds ratios for future events. I mean, 4x generally, up to 17x if you mix it with some other problems, like bad ratios. So this OxDL measure is showing endothelial destruction, and we know it links enormously in epi studies to heart attacks. So you'd have to say, Ooh, is the heresy true? Well, let's see. Did you want a little more heresy and then we'll finish? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone loves heresy, you know? So, this separate team, 2017, bang up to date, Russian team of pathologists, cardiac researchers, and these guys, <laughs> these guys are smart. I, I read this paper, went through it. They got healthy controls, type 1 diabetics and type 2 diabetics. They were looking at desilation which is actually the step before the mild oxidation. And they're saying the oxidation is downstream. 
When the LDL begins to get desiolated and begins to get a negative charge, it's already a big problem, even before it gets oxidized in your plasma. So they got the healthy controls and they did not have much of the desiolated. The type 1 diabetic had a worse pattern and the type 2 diabetic was worse, which is kind of intuitive now from what we know. And they looked how much LDL would accumulate in the intima. They actually took intimal cells from people who were killed in car accidents, so they were healthy people otherwise. They took their intimal cells to make the culture. So this is really good, representing real life. And they saw that the non-desiolated native LDL did very little in terms of getting LDL to accumulate in the intima, which is the big thing we want to know about. Then they looked at the desiolated. Boom. So now you're seeing a hugely increased uh, accumulation of LDL down in that wall based on the mild oxidation or desiolization of the LDL. And again, this is happening in the plasma, in your blood, based on what you eat, based on what you do. It's not going into the wall and getting damaged. It's getting damaged in the blood and causing damage. That's what this would say. So we'd have to say there's quite a bit in this theory. It's not really heresy. To be honest, it looks to me like current science to be discussed openly and come to a, you know, a consensus answer in coming years. But we'll see. We'll see if that happens. So layer one, two, three, and we show that the big things you need to worry about mediate and govern a huge amount of all of these three layers of whether the LDLs being higher really transcends into a pathological problem. We've added layer zero before any of this, which suggests possibly that the oxidizing and damage of the LDL in the blood is an initiating step. And if you avoid that, you may not even have to worry about this. But it's another LDL state uh, measure that's not to do with the number of the particles. It's to do with the actual science. And heart attack patients in a recent paper had vastly more oxidized LDL than non-heart attack. I think non-heart attack people healthy had 0.1%, and the heart attack people had something like 5%. Like they, were just, they just have tons more in the plasma. So it's important, and we'll need to answer these questions in the coming years. Always remember, are you on target? Because these things here aren't just helping you in many, many myriad ways. They are actually targeting the various layers that enable the high particle count to be a problem. So you're getting a double benefit by focusing on the right root causes, these and more, right? Now if, I'm going to close with, if your particle count shoots up on a diet, you cannot ignore something, and I showed you the hazard ratios earlier. That's clearly a hazard ratio marker. You can't ignore it, but you do need to take it in context. So for instance, there are APOE4 genotype people. I'm one, my wife's one, David Bobbitt has one. We have a, a tendency towards heart disease and Alzheimer's. We, we respond much worse to modern foods and modern contaminants because we're the oldest genome. But some APOE4s, there's evidence that if they become diabetic or damaged from standard American diet, and now they are diabetic, they have, in cases, a sensitivity to animal protein and fat in large amounts. So ironically, tragically, by damaging themselves, they now may be sensitive to some really good evolutionary foods. So it's kind of the corner case to watch for. Like if LDL shoots up and inflammatory markers shoot up as well and ratios shift to the negative, you got to watch it. But I think Dave will go through in much more detail uh, tomorrow, is it, or this afternoon, yeah. tomorrow, uh, on all this LDLP and on a special class of people where the P goes really high, but generally all the other metrics stay good. So are they good and on target? We'll have to wait to find out. So... That's it. Hopefully it helped. Well, thank you, Iwer.